Thank you, Lord. Amen. How many know God takes you out of your comfort zone? <laughs> I, I, we were comfortable, but if somebody wasn't, they're coming out. So, <laughs> amen. Oh, praise God. Just take in a de- breath of the Spirit. Hallelujah, Lord. Ah, oh, thank you, Lord. It's a refreshing. It's a refreshing in his presence. Amen. Amen. Well, as you can tell, I am not, I am neither Apostle Frank <laughs> <laughs> or Pastor Laura Lee. Uh, for those that um, came in a little bit late, just to let you know, if you didn't fill out a, a card, it's, this is prayer requests. And um, we've been praying for the nation. We've been praying also for our homes and our families and ourselves. So whatever is up here, we're going to let it lay before the Lord. Um, And we're going to trust him with it. We'll remove it at some point, but we're going to let it lay for now. Uh, Pastor uh, Apostle Frank and Pastor Laura Lee are in Washington, D.C. As you know, I don't know how many watched the return or any portion of the return. And they were, it was powerful, powerful, powerful. Um, And they uh, remained there. They actually, as I said previously, at 10 o'clock, were going to do a prayer service on the steps of uh, the Supreme Court. And so, um, and then Apostle, of course, he he released a word uh, to the nation uh, last night about 8.05 or 8.07, something. And so they'll be returning back today. So um, you have the Holy Spirit in me. So (laughs) that's what we're going to do today. Uh, Amen. Um, And please, ushers, don't let me forget, because I'm going to start rolling here, that we have to take an offering. But um, I do want to welcome any first-time visitors to this house. If you would, raise your hand. Any first-time visitors? Okay. Well, praise the Lord. So we're going to go into the word. Thank you, worshipers. Thank you, each one, each one. So we're we're blessed, aren't are we not, to have people that move in the spirit of God and that and that just roll and move and flow in the power of the Holy Spirit. So what we're going to do today is uh, I'm going to minister on the continue. Just do a little back background on. Uh, what Pastor Frank has shared with us, Apostle Frank, what he has shared with us concerning Hezekiah and the Hezekiah miracle blast. I'm just going to give a little background because the Lord gave me a twist to that that is a, is a word for us today, I believe. I know it was a word for me, and so I pray that it's a word for us that, will, that he will just thrust through us to be able to do the things that he has called us to do, our part. How many know we co-labor with him? We co-labor. We are his hands, his feet, his voice in the earth. Um, he can, he's God. He can certainly not, not even need us and, and use his own voice, but he chooses to move through vessels, vessels at, like you and I, to say sometimes some of the things that we wouldn't even think to say. And he uses it, and he breaks strongholds, and he, and he uses us in intercessory prayer and declarations and decrees. So I want to go a little bit. You're going to know what this is about in a minute. That towel. So Apostle has been ministering on, out of the book of Second Kings, Am I good on the mic? Am I good? Everybody can hear me? Okay. Out of 2 Kings, uh, 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 and also uh, 2 Chronicles, but the Lord's been ministering to us through Apostle Frank about um, Hezekiah and the Hezekiah miracle. And what happened was, and we know most of that, Sinatra came and he... Uh, set up a siege against uh, the Israelites. And Hezekiah became very afraid. And really what, what Sennacherib did, the king of Assyria, um, his troops and all of them, what they did was they set a spirit of fear into play against the Israelites. And Hezekiah 
you know, he didn't know what else to do. And, and the Lord, um, the Lord uh, ministered to me that something, we're going to go into that, but the Lord ministered this to me. And I'm going to declare it over you. The Lord said, you are not at the mercy of circumstances. Yes. You are not at the mercy of circumstances. I declare it over every voice, every ear that's in this house, every ear that is listening online. You are not at the mercy of circumstances. So as the Lord, as the Lord was, um, as Hezekiah got this, report he became afraid we can just align what is happening now in our world and what has happened then it just it aligns up when you look at it and you have the revelation to see exactly what god is speaking in this time and so uh hezekiah took his request well first he calls for the prophet he and he takes his he sends a messenger to the prophet to say to the prophet listen uh, this is what's happening against your God, against my God, and they're coming against us. And the prophet sends back word, of course, but Hezekiah tears his garments and he goes into the house of the Lord. And he presents before the Lord the petition, the letter that was given to him that said, this is what we're going to do and who is your God. And so it blasphemed the Lord. It mocked the God of Israel. We see that today in this nation. We see and we know that there's going Going to be a shift and a change we know that because God is going to reveal himself as never before through circumstances and situations that man will not be able to explain and he is going to do it and we believe him for it amen so under under Hezekiah many many reforms came and Hezekiah was a good king he was a good king. And when the threats came and they openly defied and mocked the Lord, uh, God Almighty, um, they, they were actually saying, you know, Hezekiah, you need to do what you need to do because you're serving a powerless God. Why did they say that? They said that because all of the nations that they had conquered before had gods that were made by human hands. Our God is not made by human hands. He is Lord God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth. He, nothing, he, his, the earth is his, I mean, the, the heavens is his throne and the earth is his footstool. And he, co, he co-labors with us because he wants to, not because he has to. And so they likened him to a powerless God. And, and from the nations that they had already conquered. I'm just going to go through a little bit, and then we're going to come to the message. The message is going to be 2 Kings uh, chapter 20, verse 12 to 19. So when we, when we see that, what does mock mean? It means the ridicule. They spoke with contempt against the God of Israel. They insulted who he was. And we know that that Hezekiah miracle blast is going to come as a direct result of what someone spoke and is speaking out of their mouths. And that is going to, that release the power of God. And is that back, am I okay here? Okay, all right. The enemy's intent is always to stop, to strip, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. When Hezekiah, when Hezekiah became sick after the Lord defeated the Assyrians, when he became sick, you know, he called on God's mercy, and God was merciful to him. And God was merciful to him because he had turned Israel, he had turned the, the land and the people away from idols. If you, read in second, if you read in 2 Kings 18 and 19, you'll see all of the reforms that Hezekiah did. Hezekiah was a godly king, and in, his, in that godliness and in, in that kingship, he brought into order the things that had gone into disorder. He brought from worshiping idols into worshiping the living God, and he created reformations and, and, and reparations in that time, and, turn, and God t used him to turn the hearts of the people back to the Lord. There was something missing, though. And as great a king 
as Hezekiah was, um, he made a mistake in his later years. You see, Hezekiah, Hezekiah became sick, and the Lord healed him. The Lord healed Hezekiah, and, um, and he sent the prophet to first say, you're going to die. Then Hezekiah repented, and he turned his eyes and his heart to the Lord, and he reminded the Lord, Lord, this is what I've done. And I'm looking, you know, I, I'm just saying, I'm giving you a record of the things that, that I've done and how my love has shown for you. And when you look at the record, it's a tremendous record. But here's what happened. We have to take that, and we have to look at where we are. And we have to know that as the church and as the people of God, we need to do what God has called us to do. We can't, we're not going to fall short of it. We're not going to stop in the middle of it. We are going to bring to birth those things that the Holy Spirit has called in intercession, in prayer, in supplications, and in petitions. If you'll go with me, go with me now to uh, 2 Kings 20. I'm going to share something. You know, we read our Bible so many times, and we see so many things in the Word. But one of the things that I will tell you that I did not see until the Lord deposited in my spirit a couple days ago were these verses, the way that I see them now. 2 Kings, beginning chapter 20, and you can study this on your own, beginning with verse 12. It said, At the time Berodach Baladan, a son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah listened to them, and he showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold, and the spices and the precious oil, and the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing, listen to me, nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah, the prophet, so the prophet's somewhere else, but he's hearing the word of the Lord. Then Isaiah, the prophet, came to King Hezekiah, and he said to him, What did these men say? And from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah answered, they have come from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, what have they seen? Isaiah asks him, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures treasuries that I have not shown them. And Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who shall issue from you, whom you shall beget, shall be taken away. And they shall become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah this that I describe as a sad, sad statement. The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought... Is it not so if there shall be peace and truth in my days? I'm going to minister from there. Hezekiah opened, he was weak, but he was also prideful. He was a man after God's own heart in the sense that he brought reforms because his father was a wicked king. He was wicked. 
and Hezekiah brought the reforms that were needed in that day and time. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Hezekiah was 25 when he assumed the throne. He was 20. He served 29 years as king. But before that, before that, as a child, as a young man, he was in the kingdom, and he was with his father, and he saw his father's acts, and, and he saw what his father did. And so in seeing what his father did, he, having a heart for God, was turning away from that generational thing that he saw, and he had probably, I'm assuming by the Spirit, he had probably seen what he seen and said, this can't go on any, far, any further, and when I get to be king, should it be the Lord's will, I'm going to bring about all of these reforms in the land, and the people will serve only one God, the Lord God, Jehovah. So what happened was God delivered, as we know. He delivered. He, he sent an angel. The angel destroyed the Assyrians. And Hezekiah got sick, it was said, during this time. So Hezekiah got sick. So even though the Lord, he was going to go, the Lord granted mercy, mercy, and God he gave the prophet the word of the Lord to, for Hezekiah to be healed. So Hezekiah started to feel pretty good. And he, start, and he was feeling well. And, and then he gets these letters, you know. He's in this state where I'm feeling really good. You know, now I got some friends that are wanting to talk to me. And I'm going to show them, uh, you know, the Assyrians are no longer here. I'm going to show them just exactly what's in, what's in these treasuries. Now notice something. He didn't say it's the Lord's treasuries. He didn't give credit or honor or glory to the Lord. What he said was, it's it, what, what Isaiah said was, in your treasuries. Have you shown? Yes, I've shown him all. Okay, so he shows him all. Follow me on this. So he shows them all. And his heart is full of pride. And he's, and he's boasting in, in what value he has, not realizing that he has just received a setup from the enemy of Israel to come in at a later time to devour and to take into captivity what was theirs to begin with. You see, we have allowed in, as Christians... We have allowed in this nation, because of our silence, we have allowed things to come into play. We have opened ourselves up and let people come and see the things that are, are in the kingdom, and we have opened ourselves up to the attack of the enemy without keeping up the breaches. We have allowed a governmental to, to rule and to reign over things that are godly principles because we kept our mouths closed. We have allowed, we have aligned ourselves in things that are ungodly simply by not speaking up. If we don't say anything, it doesn't mean we're in disagreement. It just means we're in fear. So the Lord says to Hezekiah, so Isaiah says to Hezekiah, this is the heartbreaking part, because do we realize, church, where we actually are? Hezekiah says, it's a good word. I, I looked at that and I said, Lord, why? That is not a good word. But Hezekiah said it was a good word. You know why? Because it didn't put the responsibility on him. It didn't put it on him, and the, and, the, and, the, and the burden didn't go on him, and the pain didn't go on him, and the loss didn't go on him, but it went on future generations. That's where we are today. Whatever we decide and do as the body of Christ in this day and hour, we must respond in power, intercession, prayer. We must declare, decree. Our vote does count, and we must use it, and we should vote by godly principles. I'm not declaring Republican or Democrat. I'm declaring godly principles. And so in the midst of that, what happens? Hezekiah says, 
it's okay, it's a good word, because I'm going to have peace in my day. Church, that's called compromise. And it's called complacency. And it's not called being on the front lines. It's called going to the rear because I don't want to be persecuted. Even yesterday I had a conversation. And I could see in the midst of having a conversation with this person when I was stating values, biblical values, their face began to twist. And, and their voice began to raise. And there was an argumentative kind of, not kind of, argumentative demonic force that was appearing. And, and I just, inside, I chuckled because I said, you, you know you already lost, devil. You already lost. So the Lord is challenging us. And when we, when we think about the Her Hezekiah miracle blast that is coming and the things that we have seen and what happened on Rosh Hashanah, when we look at all of that and everything that is leading up we have to be mindful of the chapter after chapter 19. The chapter after, when Hezekiah was willing, just for his own self, his own satisfaction, his own perseverance, or what's the word I need, Lord? Preservation his own preservation, was willing to sacrifice future generations. No, and if you read how Babylon took the people, it was horrible. So I want to say to us today that we are those that carry the mantle of righteousness the word of the Lord in declarations into the atmosphere, into this world. And it's not okay to be silent. It's not. It's not okay to be afraid because the Lord hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. It's not okay to be a man pleaser and not a God pleaser. It's not okay that isn't going to stand any further any time. We hold the responsibility and wear the mantle for the next generation, for our children, for our grandchildren, for our great-grandchildren, for the children of this nation, for those that are being slaughtered on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. We wear the mantle of the Lord in this time and season. We are mantled with his power, mantled with his grace, mantled with his word. We are those that stand the line. We are those watchmen, warriors, and worshipers that stand and say, no more. And in faith, we declare into the atmosphere, to the courts, to the, to the mayors, to the councilmen, we declare in our city, our state, we declare in our communities, we declare in our homes and our families that this shall not stand and that we will not sacrifice our future generations. We make the call. So Hezekiah, he says, for he thought, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. I wonder what Isaiah thought. Because Isaiah the prophet saw what was coming. He knew it wasn't a good word. But something had shifted in Hezekiah. You know, I'm just going to, talk to us all about what we deal with in life. There are things that come in our lives that will try to shift us. Now, we might not say to somebody, uh, this happened or that happened. But how many know there's a battle that goes on in the minds of God's people? And if we leave any open door, there will be a spirit of offense. There will be 
instead of this and wiping ourselves from being midwives in the body of Christ, there will be this. I'm going to do it again. We're called to be midwives in the body of Christ. We're called to hold the hand, agree with. Let me use it that way. Agree with. Come into agreement with the word of God. Agree with the Lord for what he wants to birth in the nation. Agree with the Lord for what he wants to do in our homes, in our lives, our families. How many know it starts with us? You know, I can go and I can point the finger and I can say how everybody else needs to change. But it begins with us. Repentance is personal. Repentance before God is personal. Create in me, O oh God, a clean heart first. So God wants to release into the earth. We need to challenge ourselves that when the Lord wakes us up in the night, are we going to get up or are we going to roll over? We need to challenge ourselves. Are we going to have prayer? Is it going to move from prayer to intercession? Is it going to be supplication? Are we going to beg God? There are times where we do su supplicate. There are times when we're standing in intercession for one another, just as we did here for the nation and for those that are representing the nation. They need our prayers. Amy Coney Barrett needs our prayers. How many know they're going to try to attack her? We need to stand in the gap, and we need to pray for her. We need to pray for, first foremost, this woman and this mother of seven children because they've already started it on late night, and it's disgusting. We need to pray. Intercede. What does that mean? I'm in the gap right here. You may try. You're going to try to get through, but you're not getting through. You might try to get through, but I'm not moving, and you're not getting through. That's a watchman. Church, we need to be watchmen in this hour. We need to be watchmen. And do you know that, okay, so I can't take myself and throw myself in a room for 24 hours. God knows I can't. But I can pray in the spirit and begin to decree and declare. And that tongue that God has given me will declare his works, his wonder, his protection, his power. And that's what we all need to be doing. Now think about this. God wants to birth some things in the nation. He wants to birth things in our lives. How many say, Lord God Almighty, I need a breakthrough? Amen? Amen. Lord, I need a breakthrough. Now, on the backhand of that, how many will say, boy, I've been praying I need a breakthrough, but boy, I've been getting in this mind battle right here. You're never going to get a breakthrough. It's never going to happen. Did you see how so-and-so? Come on now. we got to identify. Identify. If you don't want to identify to me, you don't have to. Identify to the Lord and declare it and get rid of it because it's an open door in our minds that will hinder us from moving forward in God's plan. It's called a distraction. God is always going to take care of us. He's always going to meet our needs. He loves us with an everlasting love. He's going to heal relationships. It's not who's right and who's wrong. It's what's God saying. And whatever he's saying, then the other needs to be put aside. And every spirit of pride needs to be rebuked. And a spirit of humility needs to come. Midwives. So we've been hearing about midwives. We're midwives because we're birthing. We're birthing what God puts within us. If you've come on Tuesday nights, you hear many various prayers. Last Tuesday, I wrote this down. Last Tuesday, we were doing these prayers. We were, doing, we were praying. We have prayers of supplication. We had uh, prayers of petitions. We were interceding. There were some declarations, and there may have been one decree. 
So prayer is how we communicate with the Lord. We all know that. Petitions are part of prayer because we're specifically asking for something. Also, there's beseeching prayers. And those prayers are, we're so desperate that we're begging. Sometime we get there. But we need to realize we don't have to beg God for anything. We just ask and we declare. And he loves us. And what father would withhold from those he loves? A declaration in the Hebrew, it's akva. It means to make known, to announce. The word means formally, uh, in a formal position, to declare, and it's very powerful. It means the word is, is, is spoken, and it's formally spoken, and it, and it goes forth in power. Because what does the Bible say? My word that I speak, it's not going to return to me void. It's going to accomplish everything I send it forth to do. But I want you to know, church, that this is that this word is a timely word. What is going on now in this, in this season and what is happening is we carry the purposes of God in, and the plans of God in our bosom and in our bellies. We carry them. Why do we carry them? We're carrying them because we're as midwives bringing birth to what God wants to do in the earth, and he is not going to... He is not going to, um, we are called to birth it by his spirit. We're not to hold back. How many know there's a delivery date and there's a delivery time? Just take one look at your birth certificate. There's a delivery date and there's a delivery time. The scripture tells us in the Ecclesiastes that the times and seasons are in God's hand. We are in a special time right now. We are in an era right now, a new Hebraic era. We are in a time where our voices need to be voicing what the Lord is birthing and putting within us. As I said before, all of the prayers that we were praying on Tuesday night, if you listen, some kind of overlapped, but others did not. They were a birthing of what God wanted to do and what he was saying and what he was looking to complete. If you haven't been here on Tuesday, listen, this coming Tuesday, Apostle Frank is going to teach on Sukkot. You need come because in the midst of that, it's a time of prayer. I'm, I'm not going to be doing the gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will do that probably the week after. But we're entering into Sukkot. But back to the midwife. Okay, so, the midwife, or those that give birth. The midwife helps with giving birth, and how does she help? She helps with words of encouragement. She helps with giving instruction. She helps with releasing words, releasing things that need to be released. She helps with positioning. She helps with everything that is needed and necessary for the birthing to take place. So, God has placed us in this position. He has called us to this time and to this season. We always use this as a cliche, it's no accident. But really, it's not. We are where we are now because this is where God placed us. We are in the place we are, in the ministries we are, wearing the mantles that God has placed within us. How many know that our mantles are stretching into new places that maybe we're not comfortable with doing or maybe we're not comfortable with saying or speaking? But that doesn't mean that we don't start somewhere. So whatever God is putting inside, which is the word of the Lord, you see those declarations declaring the word of the Lord declaring. What does the Bible say? He has an army going forth in the book of Joel, declaring the word of the Lord. So the midwife, what does she do? She's got this towel. So thankful for you, Holy Spirit, because he instructed me to bring this towel and to give an example. 
At the same time of thinking about a midwife, I saw a, a ring with fighters in it. And the Lord was correlating the two. So this midwife, so someone's giving birth, they're going to sweat. They need to be wiped off. But guess what? The towel is nearby. Does this kind of like remind us of anything? Jesus was a servant. We need to serve one another. And we're in service to the Lord. Even though we're his children, we want to do what pleases him. So, hello with the earring now. It's just a distraction. So, it's used for many things. In fact, it's used to wet, to put cold water, so that there's a refreshing that comes upon someone who's in labor. And the midwife does that. We're the body of Christ. You're one part, I'm another. We're all different parts. We're supposed to bring encouragement and refreshing to one another. We're not supposed to tear one another down. And we're not supposed to plant seeds that are later on going to harvest a curse in someone's life. There's death and life in the power of the tongue. And I've had to repent my own self from looking at situations in my own life and family and saying it's never going to change. And then I have to say, God, it is going to change. Please forgive me. Because if we stand and say it's never going to change, then that means we put the burden of ourselves to do a miracle. Only God's the miracle worker. He changes. He doesn't change. He's God. I change not. But he changes circumstances. And he changes hearts and lives of people. So then the Lord showed me. We're talking about midwives and birthing. Are you going to even be able to stop in the midst of labor? There is no stopping a baby. When it's ready to come, it, its intention is to come. It will come. We read stories. It has come. In taxi cabs. It has come in doorways. That baby has been birthed in, in hallways. That baby's been birthed out right outside the emergency room. That baby's been birthed at home. That baby will come. And God is challenging us to be the midwives to bring forth the birthing of the Lord in this time and season. The birthing of his plans and his purposes. His specific assignments in this day and hour to birth and, and pray over Supreme Court and to pray over uh, congressmen and to pray over the land, to speak to the land. How many walk around your home and your apartment complex or wherever you have it? Doesn't matter. Walk around your land. Walk around your land and declare the land is the Lord's. Walk around the land. I walk around my house. Walk around the land. Declare the blessing of the Lord on the land. Declare the blessing of the Lord in the house. Declare the blessing of the Lord. That's birthing his, his plans and purposes in the earth. So this midwife, she's helping. And when that baby's coming, that baby's coming. And that midwife's there to speak and to encourage. Now let me tell you something. When it's birthed, it's birthed. And then a towel is laid. And that birthing is in the towel. The baby goes in the towel, and they wrap the baby up in the towel. And they say, what a marvelous sight. Here is life. Here is what God planned. I am seeing the fulfillment of the word of the Lord in my life, in my home, in my family. I'm seeing the fulfillment of the word of the Lord. Not only am I seeing the fulfillment of the word of the Lord in that, but I'm seeing the fulfillment in those that I have prayed for those that I've stood with, those that have been crying out. I'm seeing a fulfillment. And God is not man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should uh, not fulfill his promises. 
But what happens? We're in a battle, and we need to recognize we're in a battle. We need to recognize that we have to push forth. We need to recognize that we have to continue to go forth. We need to recognize that the enemy will do everything that he can do to try to stop us. But we don't do this. We don't throw in the towel. We don't throw in the towel. We press through to the victory. We press through to see the things that God wants done accomplished. We press through in our families. We press through. I break every spirit of depression now off of the people of God in the name of Jesus. We bind every lie of the enemy that he's been speaking through ears, that he's been planting in minds, that there's been mindset issues. We break those words right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we declare a freedom. We declare that the word of the Lord shall be strong in our mouths, strong in our spirits. We declare the word of the Lord shall decree over circumstances and situations. And no, we are not at the mercy of a circumstance. We are walking in grace with Almighty God. Our Father who loves us makes a way where there seems to be no way. He will carve out a way. We thank you, Father, that we make a choice. How many want to make a choice today? You're going to keep your towel. You're going to keep the towel today. We're going to, we're going to birth forth and be midwives for the plans and the purposes of God. We're going to receive the fire of God. You know, we sing the song, Don't Let the Fire on My Altar Ever Go Out. But how many know sometimes it does? So what happens when a fire goes out? Two things. I guess, because that's what I'm getting, because I never build a fire. But two things. One, we either restart it. Or two, if it's not completely out, we fan that flame. Can we do that in our lives? And can we make a commitment to push through to all the things that God has? We're believing for miracles. We're believing for change. We're believing for transformation. We're believing not just for revival, because revival fires come and revival fires go. We're believing for God to move in such a way that it will usher in the presence and the power and the, and the coming of the Lord. We're in a hard season. We're in a warfare and we're in a battle. And the Lord puts us on the front lines and he calls us to his army, not so we can throw in the towel, but so we can be girded up in strength. And where does our strength come from? It comes from him. And so we go to him to receive our strength. How many are willing to do that? Thank you, Jesus. So I just want you to come to your feet. Thank you, Father. Can you take us in a song, and then we're going to do some declarations? I want you to worship the Lord. Worship Jesus. him. He's your answer. He's doing all that he can do for you right now. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Yes. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Sing it to him. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens, yeah. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. And your Like the mighty mountain, yeah. 
where you are. This had a heaviness hit my heart. If you're broken hearted, you're carrying a broken heart today. God wants to touch that broken heart today. He wants to heal that broken heart. Those tears, that pain, the cutting in, in your heart. I just want you to just receive. Let's just receive that healing. If that's you today, I just want you just real quick up and down, up and down, because I want to focus on who to pray for. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, right now, Lord, Holy Spirit, as you have just shifted that atmosphere to your own heart, that you see the pain, Lord, in people's hearts. Lord, you see the hurt that resides there. Lord, it's only you that can heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. Lord, I declare that scripture over those that have a wounded heart today, that you are the good shepherd. You know your sheep. You call them by name. And the Lord, you said that you come to bind up the brokenhearted and to heal all their wounds. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Oh, minister to the woundedness today, to the hearts that are hurting, to the relationships, Lord, that are broken. Lord, to the hurts that are buried deep, to those generational things that people are seeing repeated in their lives. Father, we thank you that you break every generational curse. Lord, that they're presented before you and that your sword, a two-edged sword, cuts through, divides, slaughters, and heals. Heal hearts today, Lord. Let your presence rest over the hearts of your people. I speak encouragement, Lord, and hope, hope to the brokenhearted. Hope, Lord. And Father, I set a hedge, a hedge over those thoughts that would come, that would deter, that would hurt, that would speak, that would torment. We bind tormenting thoughts in Jesus' name. And we thank you that we loosen your perfect plan and purpose and your healing, and a guard, set a guard, set a guard, Lord. Holy Spirit. And we use the word against the enemy, and the plans and purposes of the Lord are for good, 
and not for evil, to give an intended hope and a purpose. We thank you for it, Father. Father, we thank you for this time. And Lord, we know that you're in control and that you love us with an everlasting love. May we go in your presence and in your peace. In Jesus' name.